Convection is actually a combination of two processes, conduction and advection. Let's imagine you have a hot object, let's say a hot water bottle or something, sitting outside on a cold winter's day. So how's the heat going to escape from this? Well, there's going to be radiation, but there will be a little bit of conduction. The heat will be conducted a little bit into the air around our hot object. Now, it won't go very far because air has a very low thermal conductivity. But let's imagine it's a windy day. There's a wind blowing over it. We've now created this rather thin hot layer of air around the hot object and the wind will blow that away. This is what is called forced convection. What happens is the heat goes into the little boundary layer, this thin warm layer around its uh, from conduction and then that layer is blown away. There is now very cold air, very close to the surface of a hot object, therefore there is a very big temperature gradient, therefore more heat will be conducted into it. So once again it will rebuild that layer and that layer will be blown away again. Here is a simulation using the Energy 2D software of this force convection. We have a fan over here on the left and it's blowing fluid past the hot object. And you can see that the hot object, the heat from it, is conducted into the fluid immediately near it. And then that hot fluid is blown backwards by the fan. And it's a rather complicated and turbulent process. You can see that the uh, fluid is giving a wobbly pattern of hot air or fluid going backwards. But what happens if there is no fan or no wind? This is what we call free convection. Let's imagine we have a hot object now sitting outdoors on a cold day, on a calm cold day with no wind. What will happen is once again the heat will slowly be conducted into layers immediately near the hot object. Now as these layer gets thicker and thicker and hotter and hotter, like most fluids, its density will go down because the density goes down when things get hotter because the atoms bang into one another more. And so because it's less dense than the surrounding fluid, it will start to rise, all by itself, no external fan needed. As it rises, more cold air will be sucked in behind it, and this is what's called free convection. And here is a simulation of free convection. You see the heat can be conducted out into a layer, the layer gets thick enough, it starts because of its low density to rise upwards due to buoyancy. As it flows upwards it swirls around, it's a rather complicated turbulent process once again, and cold fluid, cold air is brought in from the bottom, and you end up with a steady vortex on both sides with the fluid rising in the centre and falling around the outside. And This is a very common situation in all sorts of rooms. And here is a side-by-side -side comparison of force convection at the top and free convection at the bottom. The main thing you can see is that force convection is usually much more effective. Can we calculate the rate of heat loss through convection? Well, mm, not really. As we saw from the simulations, convection is an insanely complicated process. The fluid flows are not smooth, they are complicated and turbulent. It's not as if the conduction happens first and then the fluid moves away. It's all happening at the same time in some incredibly complicated way. If you want to get an accurate calculation of convection, you need either to do an experiment or to actually run a full fluid dynamic supercomputer simulation. However, people have come up with a very approximate rule of thumb called Newton's cooling law. Now, Newton's cooling law says the rate of heat loss is equal to the area times the difference in temperature between the object and the surrounding fluid. And then there's a fudge factor, H in front, which includes all our uncertainty about what's going on. And H is called the heat transfer coefficient. What is the value of H? Well, in air, if it's free convection, H is typically about 5. 
If it's forced convection, it's typically about 50, but it will depend on the speed of the airflow. Might be more like 10 for slowly moving air and maybe 100 for gale force wind. In water, H is much higher. It might be about 300 for free convection and maybe 3000 for forced convection. But be careful. Don't trust these numbers very much. Individual situations, depending on the exact shape, the exact flow, may be quite different. Um, and in fact, it may not be proportional to delta T, but might be delta T to some funny power. It might be that when there's a small delta T, you get smooth flow. When there's a large delta T, you get turbulent flow, so H may be different. Reality is much more complicated than this. But as a very crude first estimate, you can use Newton's cooling law.